This is your Icewind Dale DM guide for the towns of Bremen and Targos and their quests, Lake Monster and Mountain Climb, from Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Hi, Bob here, and welcome to Bob World Builder, where we learn how to have more fun playing D&D together. So hit that subscribe button to get new guides every Wednesday, and this one is brought to you by the Simplified Survival Rules in Cold Blood now available on the DM's Guild. Bremen is a small, sleepy town across the Mare Walden from Tourmaline and Lonelywood, at the mouth of the nearly frozen Shangarn River, which separates it from the neighboring town of Targos, only two hours away. It's friendly, but has little to offer besides a lake monster and an old dwarven speaker, Dorbel Gruff Shalescar, who often wanders into the tundra. Bremen's crest represents the gold sought by its founding dwarven prospectors and the town sacrifices warmth on the new moon. Unlike other small towns, Bremen does have an inn, Buried Treasures, which caters mostly to gold prospectors in the spring and summer, so the owner, Cora Mulfoon, tries to conceal the fact that she is barely making ends meet during the rhyme. Cora will give a brief excuse about her son being gone, unless the party asks for details, but I think she should just break down before them. No one in town, not even her, understands what happened to her son, how he got lost during a search for the town speaker and stumbled in the following morning riddled with frostbite. A miracle he survived at all, and how he quickly recovered but became so cruel to her, so she secretly searched his room and found a strange shard of black ice. But he came in and snatched it away and threatened her very life should she even look at it again. Then, out of nowhere, he left the next day with two tieflings offering him a home in their castle. This whole event is a hook for the quest in Kaer Dineval, but it's also a great way to plant the first seed for the Sunblight plot from Chapter 3. By deciding that Korra kept and locked away a tiny fragment of the strange ice and she'll happily give it to the characters if it helps them find her son. Bremen is also written to have five taverns in a town that could barely support one, so I would keep the story of the five rival brothers, but only one operational tavern. Then, maybe your players can hire one of the failed entrepreneurs to run the ramshackle inn in Lonelywood if they claimed it for defeating the moose, or even claim one of these defunct taverns for defeating the lake monster. But the quest isn't quite that simple. As your party approaches the docks, an angry dwarf yells at them for being late, insisting he hired them to catch knucklehead trout. But old Grinsk barrel bore was just drunk when he hired some other fishers who have since decided five copper per trout wasn't worth the risk. He offers two rowboats, one with an obvious bite mark, and blames the ice, stubbornly ignoring or denying any talk of a lake monster until Tally, the non-binary half-elf wildlife researcher, asserts that this is a deadly job, and the dwarf stomps off. As written, Tally offers nothing but gratitude for details on the monster, but the conclusion states that they will award five gold and a scroll of animal friendship. So I would lead with that and set a DC 16 charisma check for Tally to give them the scroll up front because it would be incredibly helpful for this mission. Then there's a section about dodging ice flows, detailing the boat's AC, hit points, and speed, plus a table for lake events and a table for various encounters with the monster. But here's my plan. The party makes one DC 15 survival check to dodge the ice while moving to open water. Then. After one hour of waiting or trout fishing, the plesiosaurus, which you should only describe, not name, attacks the boat. If your party dodged the ice, the surprise attack is ineffective, but now they roll initiative. If they failed the ice navigation check, it rocks the weakened boat, and everyone must now make a DC-12 athletics group check to keep it from capsizing, then roll initiative. The important thing is that the so-called monster just wants to keep Ravison happy for granting it intelligence. So unlike the white moose, this rowdy dino can be convinced to stop killing people with a DC-18 persuasion check, confirming that Ravison cannot take away its new intelligence. And using the scroll will give advantage on this check. Overall, Bremen makes a great starting town, with its seeds to care Dineval and Sunblight, its serious and silly NPC interactions, and its unique social combat with the lake monster. But as your party heads to Targos or anywhere else in Icewind Dale, you're going to run into the somewhat tedious inventorying side of D&D. So if you want a simple solution to tracking your party's resources, you want to check out Cold Blood by Alice Loverdrive. 
From its minimalist cover and layout to the casual yet concise writing, this is my kind of supplement. Rather than bookkeeping all your rations, rope, torches, tinder, water, etc., Cold Blood provides an alternative load-based system where all characters have up to twice their strength modifier uses of an adventurer's pack that holds pretty much anything they may need for survival. In addition, it has a new rest system that's really about keeping yourself sane, perfect for the horrors of Icewind Dale, new consequences for death that can turn you into a monster, a stat template for the icy undead, two new monsters, and if it wasn't concise enough, a one-page rules reference guide. Cold Blood is available now on the DMs Guild, and checking it out through the affiliate link below is a great way to support the channel. Then, across the river from Bremen lies the wood-walled town of Targos, the most successful fishing town in Icewind Dale. It has everything your party needs, but is less friendly and comfortable than neighboring Brinshander. Though its 1,000 inhabitants admire the speaker, Nerth Maxildenar, who is secretly an agent of the Zentarum, with his right-hand tiefling, Skath, acting as a sort of sheriff. The town crest represents Targos's impressive fishing fleet, and they sacrifice people to Ariel. This travel table says Bremen is three, not two hours away, so take your pick, but Targos is two hours away from Brinshander to the southeast, and four from Tourmaline to the northeast. And while there is no mention of it here, Tourmaline tells us that Speaker Maxildenar is conspiring to oust their speaker and replace him with a loyal officer. And, with Bremen's speaker described as not long for this world, we can assume Maxildenar has plans to claim that town as well. And Lonelywood probably has enough Zentarum members to be his town already. So you can easily spin this minor Zentarum presence into a sprawling conspiracy subplot if your players are interested in the politics of Ten Towns. And hey, if you like these tips, remember to like the video and subscribe, and consider joining Patreon to get one-page PDF guides for these quests. Thanks. This Zentarum operation is based out of the Targo Speaker's home in the Luskin Arms Inn, where he keeps tabs on all travelers entering the region around Mare Dualden. Though the place is infested with rats, and the owner, Owen Tarsenel, is too depressed to notice any of this happening right under his nose. Unlike the over-attentive tavern keeper of Three Flags Sailing, Ethan Yarbrough, who treats all her guests like her own children, and they kindly refer to her as Ma. So at one of these locations, or the general store with a funny name, your party should be approached by a friendly, bouncing sled dog dragging its broken harness and urging the party to follow. This dog leads them to the home of a scrimshander named Keegan, who explains that his husband, Garrett, a mountain guide, left a few days ago with the dogs and a group of adventurers headed to Kerkonig, then to climb Kelvin's Cairn. But this good dog, named Boy, would never have left Garrett's side unless something terrible had happened. So your PCs may go through Bryn Shander and Ker Dinaval on the way to Ker Koenig, where any of the shopkeepers can give some information about Garrett's party and their plans. And where your party can hire their own mountain guide named Jartha Farzash at Frozen Far Expeditions. However they head to Kelvin's Cairn, your group is written to spend 8 hours searching for Garrett's base camp with a DC-15 survival check. So I would definitely have Boy tag along, because he can lead them right to the camp, where they'll find 5 more dogs and a crate of rations, and then right to his master. Passing by some mountain goats, one of whom could be awakened if you want, and hopefully alerting your party of the impending avalanche on the way up, and the two crag cats who are about to pounce on Garrett as the party arrives. Definitely use one or zero cats if you're running for one player. But if Garrett survives the attack, he gives more details about his clients, explains they were attacked by a yeti, and implores the party to climb the mountain and search for them. Based on measurements in the avalanche encounter, and the definitely not to scale drawing of Kelvin's Cairn, the peak is about 2,000 feet high, and the party must climb a few hundred from Garrett to the frozen cave, making a DC-10 athletics group check to make any progress and avoid exhaustion. The cave has a bloody entrance and two main chambers. Area 1 is an 80-foot deep chasm with a stone bridge to Area 2, which they can see is a passage strewn with bones of the Goliath adventurer and decorated with the heads of other humanoids, including Ubok from the Bryn Shander Foaming Mugs quest, and another random adventurer, Barthum Hammerholm, whose headless body is farther up the mountain. All that said, characters can instead walk across an ice bridge in Area 1 to avoid that gross passage and go directly to Area 3, where Mama Yeti is watching her cute Yeti tyke pawing around the only surviving adventurer, a halfling acolyte of Yandala, 
named Paralu Fishfinger. The Yetis here do not want to fight, but as your party is leaving, Papa Yeti returns with a fresh mountain goat, and he will tear them limb from limb unless someone has the littlest Yeti secret, or something really good to trade for safe passage. And if you have a wizard in the party, make sure your group finds the third adventurer, a frozen solid tiefling with a loaded wizard spellbook and a potion of invisibility. But for a homebrew twist, consider having Garrett or one of these adventurers, probably the tiefling, be miraculously alive because they found a piece of Shardolin and just like Korra's son from Bremen, survived their night in the tundra by selling their soul to the archdevil Levistus. More on that in the Care Dinaval Guide. Now remember to check out the Cold Blood Survival Rules, and if you want PDFs of these guides, join Patreon like Esteban, Richard, Andre, Aaron, Jean-Paul, Johnny Mac, Dexter, Hex the Necromancer, David, Haley, Mito, and Joseph just did. Thank you all for your support, and keep building.